this is a this is a bad day for Daniel. Daniel, at this point, when we met Daniel in chapter one, he was a young teenager who was stolen away from Jerusalem that was destroyed by the Babylonians and brought into the Babylonian Empire. And within the first three years became one of the main leaders, counselors to King Nebuchadnezzar. As this chapter opens up, he's in his 80s. A lot of time has passed. He has outlived the Babylonian Empire and he is still a counselor. But this is a bad day for him. He is, he is uh, schemed against, he is tempted or tested, he avoids the trap and is falsely accused and faces an attempt to destroy him. When I look at this chapter and I think of this day for him, I think of our own lives and that you and I live in something that is similar. We have, we have an enemy who is looking to destroy us, who is looking to trap us. And if we pass the, the if sometimes we give in to the temptation and then he, he accuses us, he is the accuser. And sometimes if we pass the trap, the test the temp, the, that's there, the temptation, then he has no problem slandering us. He has no problem uh, accusing us falsely of doing something. The Bible tells us that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we have a very real enemy that wants to destroy us as well. And looking at this passage helps us understand what is called spiritual warfare a little bit better. And I want to talk about spiritual warfare today. I want to cover this text and I want to talk about spiritual warfare. But I also want you to know that spiritual warfare is, is that one place where you find more false teaching than good, solid teaching. It is that place where people will just go, woo, good, solid teachers all of a sudden, they're out there. And they're talking about things that are just not biblical at all. And there are many, many practices taking place in churches that, that emphasize spiritual warfare that are not biblical in any way, shape, or form. And it doesn't do any good. We, we have to keep our belt of truth on. It doesn't do any good if we're doing these acts that don't have any power to them at all because for whatever reason, we think they have power. Remember, Satan is a deceiver. He's the father of lies. And if he can come in and deceive us and get us doing something that's a practice that isn't biblical and isn't doing anything, then I just see him chuckling behind the scenes. It's like, look at, look at what I got these Christians doing. They're doing this and they think, they think they're taking authority over, over me. When the only authority that we have is in Christ and is in truth. And we've been given a lot of it. I think you're going to see that as we get into this today. We have been given a lot of it. But we need to be careful because false doctrine is just, is just um, it's invasive. Throughout, throughout all of Christianity, there are just so many things people believe that are wrong. The fact that we have an enemy. Listen to Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. The word for wiles there is schemes, plans. He's got some plans for you. You may be able to stand against the plans or the schemes, the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's, it, when, when, when something's happening and your old life is coming apart, it's not flesh and blood we wrestle against, but against principalities, powers, and against rulers of the darkness of this age, a spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Going all the way back to the word principalities there. We see the prince of Persia in the book of Daniel. We see the prince of Greece in the book of Daniel. And these are spiritual beings that are over these, these, these countries. So it seems like this is some kind of a ranking of of the power or the military power of these spiritual beings. Principalities, powers, rulers, darkness against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. If it's not any kind of a ranking, it certainly is different kind of powers that we face. Now that might scare you that you've got someone scheming against you, that the enemy wants to come against you and that you are in a spiritual battle. But before we're done, I, I'm hoping to take any of that fear away because sometimes we feel like, you know what? If I leave him alone, he'll leave me alone. So maybe I just won't be too much in the battle here. 
and he'll just leave me alone? And I don't think it really works that way. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's why you've got to be vigilant. That's why you can't say, you know what, I'm just going to leave him alone. Hopefully he'll leave me alone. He wants, he attacks us because he wants us to be ineffective in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Putting on your armor, what do you put on your feet? They are prepared with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that everywhere you go, you take the gospel with you. And the battle, you know, most wars are fought over land. Most wars are because one country wants to gain other land. And this battle is over land as well, but it's over people. The land is people. The enemy wants to destroy people, and God wants us to be used to bring them into the kingdom of God. That's the battle that you and I face. That's the battle that you and I are going through. And, and, and I want to say that we shouldn't freak out that we're in the midst of a spiritual battle. We shouldn't be scared of it. Romans 8, 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If you've got God on your side, then we don't have to be afraid of Satan. We don't have to be afraid of doing a good job for the kingdom of God because God's on our side. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, And I also say to you that you are Peter. This is in Caesarea Philippi. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. It's not Peter that he built the rock on, by the way. It's two different words there. On, 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 on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. We have been given a guarantee for success. The gates of hell won't prevail. We, the, the church has been built on the rock, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against us. He says, and I give you the keys to the kingdom. Revelation chapter 1, do you remember what Jesus says there? I am the beginning, the end, the alpha, and the omega. I have the keys to the kingdom. He says, I'm God Almighty, and I have the keys to the kingdom. Or Almighty God, he says, and I have the keys to the kingdom. Well, he gives us the keys to the kingdom. We, we can let people in. I, I've joked about that before when I've talked to someone. They've said something to me, and I said, well, I've got the keys to the kingdom. I can let you in. I, I know how you get into heaven. I can open the door. We are told, we've been entrusted with that and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, verse 19, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That has been massively misused and I don't have time to go into great detail as to exactly what it means right now, but I can tell you, you're not going to bind something God doesn't want bound and you're not going to lose something that God doesn't want loosed. You can't run around and go, I bind you in the name of Jesus when God didn't want to do it. God's saying he has given us authority and that we can go out in that authority and we can bind and loose things. And we'll talk about that at some other point. So let's, uh, let's do this. Let's take a look at our text. I want to read our way through it. I want us to have that spiritual warfare in mind. And then at the end of this, I want to come back and look. I think it's six uh, passages that I've got that will help us to learn a little bit more about spiritual warfare and how we can be involved in it. And we'll see it as we, as we look through this text as well. So we pick it up in verse 6. Of chapter 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. Now, a little bit later on, we're going to learn that Darius is not Cyrus. So Cyrus had taken the kingdom from Belshazzar, and Darius is this intermarry king, or he is a, um, a regional king. We don't know anything about Darius. I had told you that people had criticized the book of Daniel because Bel. Uh, uh, Belshazzar was, not, was not, not found anywhere else in history until they found the cylinders of Nabunidus in Babylon. Nabunidus uh, was the last king of Babylon and they found that he had a son or son-in-law named Belshazzar. So he really did exist. Well, Darius was another one that they said at the same time. This guy's nowhere else in history. And so, we, so who is he? And it's just made up. Whoever wrote this just made him up. And, and we have never found anything. But I'm confident that Darius is a real individual. I'm confident that, that, we, we, that history and time will find it in archaeology, or if it's not found, we will one day know in heaven, oh, that's who Darius was. That's, that's how he fits into it. The Bible just, he just comes on the scene. It doesn't give us how he fits into it. We don't find him anywhere else in history, but that doesn't bother me. Critics like to bring it up, but when they do bring it up, I can respond really well to a lot of other people when they denied other people's existence like David, like, like Pilate, 
like Belshazzar, that history, archaeology discovered that they were really around. So I'm not worried about Darius. It says, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. We assume these satraps are just leaders, right? Uh, to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one. So he saw what the other leaders had saw, that Daniel had this skill and, of wisdom and understanding. And it says, then uh, this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the king saw Daniel operating and said, man, you know what? Maybe I'll just forget these, all three of these guys and I'll set him over the entire realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find a charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error, error or fault found in him. So they were vetting him, right? They were trying to find, what, what, let's find something. We got to do something to destroy this guy. So they went into his, you know, into his background. They looked at anything that they could and they couldn't find anything. And of course, that's what we all want, right? We want to live our lives in such a way that if anybody goes, I'm gonna, let's, let's follow this guy around. Let's hire a private detective. Let's follow this guy around. Let's find out what's going on. Let's set up some, you know, spotting scope and look into his windows. See what's going on. Scaring any of you guys? You know, I, do, do we want that kind of scrutiny? But Daniel had it and there was nothing there. There, there, was, there was absolutely nothing. And we really want to be that because Daniel gave, you know, we talked about this last week, give no place to the devil. That's, that's one of the ways that you defeat the enemy. You defeat temptation by giving no place to the devil. Daniel had not given any place to the devil. There was no place the devil could go in and go, I can get him there. I can take him out with that. Daniel, there, there was nothing that could be done. And so it says then in verse 5, then these men said, what shall we find? Uh, we shall not find a charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of God. And so now because they can't find anything against him, they begin to scheme against him. And that's where we're reminded in Ephesians chapter 6 that the devil schemes against us. The devil came to Jesus and was asking for Peter that, he could, that Satan could sift him like wheat. And Jesus said to Peter, but I've prayed for you, and when you're restored, strengthen the brethren. Which is always such an interesting series to me. Because if Jesus prayed for me, you would think I wouldn't be sifted. Satan's asking you that he can sift you like wheat, uh, but I've prayed for you, and when you're restored, strengthen the brethren. You're kind of like, wait a minute, if you pray for me, why do I need to be restored? I shouldn't need to be restored if you prayed for me. But God allowed that sifting process to take place. God allowed that testing from Satan to take place. And I find that there are certain people, and you know what, really, honestly, I find that, that women seem to be a little bit more dialed into the spiritual realm and that women quicker than most men go, this is an attack. This is the enemy. I, I'm very slow to come to that realization for whatever reason. You know, I'm just kind of cooking along. I'm doing things. Hard, difficulty comes, right? I'm going to fix it. And maybe that is because you know, us guys are just a lot more like fixing. We just fix things. We just want to fix it. What do we got to do to fix this? And then all of a sudden, someone says, I think, I think this is an attack. And lights go off. Bing! Oh, yeah. I think it is an attack. I think you're right. So, so they begin to scheme against him now to find something concerning the law of his God because they saw him serving God. He didn't hide that he served uh, the God of Israel. So the governors, verse 6, the governors of satrap, satraps, um, thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom and administrators and satraps and counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 40 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, First of all, it says they thronged the king. So it's like these, get, these guys all got together and said, let's get Daniel. It's time to get him. Let's get him out of here. We're just going to, we are, we are going to get this guy. And they go in and they say, oh, king, all, everybody's agreed. Except everybody hadn't agreed. Because one of the top three advisors 
had been completely left out. They said everybody agreed. Daniel didn't go, yeah, please, go ahead and attack me. Try to find a way to destroy me. Sure, I vote for that. So they're lying when they say it. And, and they give this decree. Nobody can pray to anybody but you. And I think Darius is like, I like that. I like the idea of people praying for me. Appealing to men's ego often is a way to, uh, it's often a way to, to win their heart. You learn that in sales, by the way. You, you learn that, you know, a little flattery, a little flattery helps. And so no one would pray for you, and if they don't, they're thrown into the lion's den. And um, then verse 8, Now, O king, establish a decree and sign it in writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, there is a law of the Medes and Persians. This is not made up. People who say that Daniel didn't write this in 600 B.C., but wrote it in 135 B.C., will say, well, he just knew that. I mean, it was common knowledge. I don't know how common it was, but what we do know about the Medes and Persians is that they had a decree that could be signed, and nobody could change it once it was signed. Once it was signed, it was signed. So th this is a very real decree. In verse uh, 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in, and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, which had been destroyed, right? But that's where the temple had been. That's where it had been destroyed. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. He didn't go, tell me I can't pray. I'm going to go pray. It's like if all of a the sudden there was a law made that we could not pray. I know there are laws that say people can't pray in school. But every time kids are taking a math test, they're praying, by the way. But there may be laws, you know, in certain states that people can't, can't pray in schools. But if, they, if it made it illegal for us to pray, some people would be like, I'm praying. I'm going to go pray now because I pray. But you weren't praying before. Your prayer life before was really not very, you know, prolific. And now all of a sudden you're like, I'm praying all the time. I'm praying for everybody. I'm going to pray everywhere I go. Stand in line in the grocery store. You're praying out loud. Seeing a police officer. You're praying. You're letting him see you pray. That wasn't Daniel. Daniel wasn't just praying because that decree had been signed. Daniel's doing what he had always done which maybe gives us one of the reasons that he was so effective in the spiritual realm on this attack. He was prepared for it. And I think when it comes to, when it comes to, to spiritual warfare, Jesus takes three of his disciples up on a mountain and, and they see him in all of his glory, right? And he talks to Moses and Elijah, Mount of Transfiguration. They come down from that mountain and the disciples that were down there we're trying to cast a demon out of a boy who would throw himself into fire and water and try to kill himself. They couldn't do it. And so Jesus prays and this boy is delivered. And so they say to Jesus, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus says, this kind only comes out with much prayer and fasting. So you, you get the idea that, that you got to pray and fast a lot and then you're going to have the spiritual power to be able to handle those things. I don't know that that's what's being said. I, I don't know that, that we're supposed to fast so that we gain spiritual power. I've heard that teaching a lot. I was in a church when I was a teenager that taught that, that, that when you were done fasting, if you, could fast for, if you could fast for 30 days, the power of God would shoot from your fingertips if you could, if you could fast for, for that long. And if you prayed for a really long time, you became really powerful. I think something different is being said by Jesus. I think that he's saying, if you really care for that kid, if, you, if you're willing to fast for him and you're willing to pray for him, that that's how you gain authority over demonic spirits in someone's life. Because fasting is, is grieving. And, and you could fast in general over the, the effect of Satan in the lives of people today. And that may give you power when it comes spiritually to, to really being able to take authority. Because you're, you're, you're fasting, you're mourning, you're caring, you're praying. And you may be praying for those things. It's not just praying to get spiritual power. That, to me, today, smacks of ungodliness. I want to, have a, I want to, be, I want to be the most powerful spiritual person ever. So I'm going to fast and pray more than anybody. Eh, I'm not sure that's what God wants. But that we would really have a heart be broken over abortion. And so we fast. 
You know, we, we, we talked this last week about murder on, on the weekend. Taking someone's life is wrong because inherent in taking someone's life, it, it's, 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 it's immoral. And, and I thought about the unborn. I didn't want to go into it because I had so much time. So I didn't want to go into it. But uh, if, that's, if that's what strikes you, then you should, you should fast over it. You should take time off from eating and saying, God, I'm going to seek you during this time. I'm going to fast and pray. And I believe that there's a power and a strength that comes from that. Not just you growing like a stronger wizard because you fasted and prayed, but that you really are caring about a certain issue and really going over it. And Daniel, he prayed and he had things right between him and God. And I think that that helped him to have things proper, not making him some super, you know, spiritual, strong believer. But the fact that he had things right allows you to be able to face those difficulties that come your way in a powerful way. And so he prays, um, so he prays just as he did from his early days. Then these men of the assembly found Daniel praying. So now there's a little espionage going on. They find him praying and making supplication before the God. This is what they wanted. They went before the king and they spoke concerning the, de the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man that petitions any God or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the lions, the den of lions? The king answered and said, This thing is true, according to the law of the Medes, Pers Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said to the king that Daniel, who is one of the captivities of Judah, does not show due regard to you, O king, for he decreed for the decree that you have signed, but he makes petitions three times a day. And the king, when he had heard these words, was greatly displeased within himself. And I like that. I, I like that he was displeased with himself. A lot of times we point other places. He could have been greatly displeased with the satraps and governors that came, but he was greatly displeased with himself. He saw his own arrogance, his own pride. He saw the trap that brought him here. And he set his heart on, on, on Daniel to deliver him and labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. I take it that Daniel was going to be executed at sundown. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, O king, uh, know, O king, that this is the law of the Medes, Medes and the Persians, and no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the, the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the lion's den, or the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. So the king knew that Daniel served God continually. And he said, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and, and the king sealed it and his own, with his own signet ring, with the signet of his lords. And he purposed concerning uh, Daniel, uh, uh, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So he put him in the lines and didn't want to, but he puts him in there. It's his own pride and arrogance. There's the scheming of these guys that have done it. And Daniel's in there with the lions now. Um, now, one of the kings went in, the, uh, in uh, excuse me. <clears throat> now, the king went into his palace. I was thinking of something else while I was trying to read. It doesn't always work. Now, the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And the musicians were brought before him. Also, uh, excuse me, no, no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. And the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king saying, Daniel, uh, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve confidently been uh, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? I, I heard David Guzek say one time it, that if he were Daniel, he would have waited five seconds before he answered. He just would have made the king, you know, sweat it out a little bit. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I have found, was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. He says, I didn't, I, they said that I didn't give you regard, but I've done no wrong before you. Now, we remember 
that the earlier story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace have one as of the Son of Man walking around with them. And Daniel says that God has sent his angel to protect them. And we don't have any idea who this angel is. Doesn't identify him as the angel of the Lord, but you remember that, that Jesus appears as the angel of the Lord. And this very well could have been, you know, Daniel's in a lion's den. And Jesus is from the lion. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah made a shut up, showed up and just said, nah, guys, no, can't do this. And so Daniel spends the night there with an angel and all of these lions. There's been a lot of depictions of Daniel in the lion's den. I've seen him where, where you know, he's, he's fervently praying while these lions are roaring around him. But my, my favorite one is he's glancing up at a window and the lions are all kind of lousing around, sleeping behind him. He's got his hands behind his back. And he's just looking up at the window. And what I don't like about the picture is there's lion poop smeared everywhere. They thought they had to make it really realistic. And that grosses me out. But everything else in the picture I like because I think that that's the confidence that he had. But I've never seen one with an angel there. That an angel showed up. But that's exactly what he said happened. Now you and I have ministering angels. We're, we're not in this battle alone. God has given us angels that minister to us. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, ministers came and angels came and ministered to him. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, when it was done, angels came and ministered to him. And are they not all, Hebrews tells us, ministering spirits sent to minister to those that have life? You and I have angels. And I don't think that God allows us to see into that spiritual realm much. I realize people will say I've seen angels and maybe, maybe you have. I have a hard time believing you. I'll just let you know that. When people say to me, I saw an angel, I'm always like, Here, in my mind, I hear, no, no, you didn't. That's what I say in my mind. But that's not, this, I'm, could be, I could be wrong. You might have seen them. Maybe you did. But we have angels that are ministering around us. And it's good for us to know in the battle that we wage for the souls of men and women against the God of this world that we have angels that are on our side. We have Jesus Christ with us as well. We have angels that are on our side. Verse 23, Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that he should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found in him because uh, he believed in his God. That's a great reason. We believe in God and we will be protected. Some of the passages I want to read to you on spiritual warfare say something along those lines. And the king gave the command and they brought these men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, their, them, their children, and their wives. That little section is always left out of the Sunday school version. <laughs> it's never added in. The other guys get thrown in, but their children and their wives don't. And there is, uh, th there may be a lesson there for us. And I realize that this is a, a pagan culture and you, you remember that Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing? He said, if you guys don't tell me what my dream is and the interpretation, I'm going to kill you and your family and I'm going to make your house a, 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 a dung heap. So this is something they did in their culture was to kill families with them. And it may be that we, when, when we sin, when we give in to sin, when we give in to a severe sin, we often think we're in it alone, but we aren't. There's the people around us, especially the closest ones to us. We may even be able to talk about leadership here, that as, as men, we've been given a leadership position in our home that a lot of times when we do something, we take wives and children with us into some kind of difficulty. It's like an umbrella that's there. And there's some kind of a difficulty that comes on. I don't want to push that too much because that's a little bit outside of what it's really saying, but at least it's a thought. It's a good thought for us to, to know that we don't do anything isolated. That when we do things, people around us are affected. And the lion overpowered them, it says, and broke all of their bones to pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. In other words, these, these lions were hungry. They didn't eat Daniel because, oh, we had two you know, sat traps yesterday. Eh, don't want another one. Then King Darius wrote. Now we get a decree from, from Darius. And this is very much like Nebuchadnezzar. To all peoples, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, 
Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth. He has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And so there we have Cyrus coming on the scene and we'll talk about Cyrus a little bit later on. By the way, this marks the end of the easy part of the book of Daniel. The six stories that are told in these first six chapters, I've seen people just teach these six stories and say, we're done. Okay, that's been a good study. Let's move on. Our series has been these first six books because the next ones get, we get to some complicated prophecies. We get to some things that are a little bit difficult. So you guys need to come next time ready to, you know, to, to buckle down a little bit to see some connections, to get involved in some prophecies and powers from, uh, that the book of Daniel is known for. The book of Daniel is known as a last day's books that talks about last day's things. That's what we get in the second half of the book. The first half of the book is the faithfulness of these men who were not part of this world, but were part of the kingdom of God. And we get story after story after story that shows that. So let's take a few minutes to talk about our spiritual battle before we're done here. In um, Ephesians 6, 1 through 13, I read you the first part of that. It says that we're to put on that armor. And I just went over all the armor on Sunday, so I'm not going to do it again. But what I do want to encourage you to is to make sure that you have the armor on. Somebody said to me one time that they get up in the morning and they, they pray and they say to God, I'm putting on my helmet of salvation and I'm putting on my breastplate of righteousness and I'm putting on my belt of truth. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that was wrong. I, I'm just saying, I'm not sure that that's what it means. It, it's probably a good thing to go, I need to make sure that my feet are prepared with the gospel today. I need to make sure I walk in truth today. I need to make sure things are right between me and God today. I need to make sure that I have genuine salvation. I need to have my shield of faith and I'm not gonna listen to the lies of the enemy. I have the word of God. I'm gonna live by the word. That's all good. It's, every, it's good every so often just to check those boxes off and to ask yourself, do I have my armor on? Because armor protects you in the middle of the battle from the blows of the enemy. And so if we want to go out into battle and we want to fight against the enemy, we want to rescue souls from hell, then we want to have our armor on. So it's good for all of us to check now, but it's good for all of us to check periodically that we have it on. Now, not only do we have this defensive armor that we get to wear with an offensive weapon, the Word of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for the pulling down of strongholds. It's not a literal sword. It's not a literal spear. They're not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. We've been given weapons that we will win with. And then it gives us some of these things that we do casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We face arguments all of the time. We face the lies of the enemy. We face it through his ministers that say that they're Christians. They look Christians. They, they, they act like Christians. They talk like Christians. They quote the Bible like Christians. They smell like Christians. They walk like Christians, not Egyptians but they're not. They got their lies. And, you know, you, you, sometimes you see, you, you watch a video, I'll watch a video sometimes on YouTube, and um, I listen to it, and then all of a sudden, one little phrase comes up. And, you know, they don't say on the bottom, this is the Seventh-day Adventist church. So I'm watching this video, and all of a sudden, just a phrase, just a phrase. And I'm familiar enough with it that I go, I wonder who this is. And so I'll look up the little name underneath it, Seventh-day Adventist. They don't say they're Seventh-day Adventist. Jehovah's Witnesses do the exact same thing. They put together these videos. And the crazy thing is, they're covering things that are 100% right. Because what they're trying to get you to do is to watch them and go, well, that's right, this person's good. Oh, I like this person, he's good. And then they click on there, and the next thing you know, they're on a video talking about 
Well, Jesus was the first one created. He didn't create everything. Uh, he, well, he created everything after he was created. He was the first. So all of a sudden they're telling you these things and you're listening to the scriptures and you kind of taken it a little bit. So you got to be careful because we're dealing with arguments. The enemy wants to get us believing lies. That's why we wear the belt of truth. And uh, all it takes is a little bit of arsenic to, just, to make a plate of food poisonous. And sometimes we, we, we hear people teach and it ministers to us. Then somebody says that person teaches false teaching and I have people get upset at me. I like that person. I don't think they do. I, don't, I like them. I've heard them quote the Bible. Are you, is your commitment to God or is your commitment to a person? If you've been ministered to by me and then you find out that I'm a false teacher, I want you to stop listening to me. I, and if you find out that someone's a false teacher, don't defend the false teacher. See if it's true. Maybe the accusation against them isn't true. Test it like the Bereans, more fair-minded. No, Thessalonians. Thessalonians are more fair-minded than the Bereans. Or is the Bereans? No, Bereans who are more fair-minded than Thessalonians because they received the word of God with all joy, but then they searched the scriptures to see if these things were true. And you find out that somebody's teaching you something wrong. Do you, you, you have to take that initiative to not be deceived. This is all spiritual warfare. The enemy has tried to convolute and make the truth just, he wants to he muddy it up. Get as much disinformation out there as he can so that it's hard for us to grab a hold of the truth. But it's not hard. I almost held up my iPad because we have iPads. We have, because we have the Bible, because we have the Word of God. So that's what we go back to. And we go, if somebody's going to teach that Jesus had to be born again, they take some verse that says something and they twist it to say that Jesus had to be born again. And, and therefore you can be God when you're born again. So he starts teaching that kind of nonsense to you. Don't go, well, that person said so many good things. To, uh, I was felt so good. I, I was ministered to by them. Immediately just reject them. Reject what they're teaching. Because is your love for that person who ministered to you or is your love for God? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. But hey, we got to, don't be surprised, the Bible says, that Satan's ministers look like angels of light. Because Satan himself shows up as an, as an angel of light. That's why they're deceiving they look good. And so it casts down every argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we want, to be, we want to be receiving the knowledge of God because that's the truth and it sets us free. And then it goes on to say here in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 10, uh, uh, cast down every argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That is that we can control our minds. We don't have to think something. We can bring it under control. We could say, I've been believing that, but it's wrong, and I'm now going to believe this. We also just don't have to go wherever the enemy goes. I don't know whether it was Martin Luther or not, but there's the famous saying by somebody somewhere a long time ago, some old dead guy that was a Christian. You can stop a bird from flying, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. And so Satan throws a thought at you, you know, you might not be able to stop that thought, the fiery dart, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. 1 John 4, I'm just going to give you, uh, i got five verses here. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He, he, he refers to them as little children here, and then says, but you're going to overcome the world, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. This tells us that Jesus cannot, put, uh, excuse me, that Demons cannot possess you. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You already got a spirit possessing you. And this is one of the false teachings that, you know, the reason you're struggling so much is because there's a demon that's making you do it. Now, I believe that we can give a place to the enemy. I believe that sometimes the enemy can oppress us. I think that is often misused and there's weird teachings that come out of it. They'll turn the word oppression into a possession. They really mean possession when they say oppression. They got to take somebody in a room and they got to cast a demon out of them. That doesn't sound like oppression to me. I think that when we open up and, and allow the enemy a place in our lives, sometimes he can oppress us. And there might be a depression from that oppression. There might be, um, there might be some, some believing some wrong things because of that oppression that the enemy's been able to put you under. So we want to make sure that we don't. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Not greater is he that's in you than he that's in you. You as a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. Neither can any Christian that's out there. Revelation 12, 11 says, they, it's talking about people in the tribulation period, 
the tribulation saints and, and the Israel that was left and came to the Lord in the middle of the tribulation period, the majority of Israel, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their own lives. There are three things that they did to overcome him. Number one, the blood of the lamb. When I was in the, I was in the Pentecostal church from 16 until 20 or so, I walked away from the Lord for a year in there, but I was in the Pentecostal church and, and we used to plead the blood over people. If somebody had something weird going on, if it, was, if it was a mental illness or if it was just somebody being weird, and you know what they say, 5% of the population are weird. If you've always got somebody around, you can go, ooh, I need to plead the blood over that person. So we'd go into a room, take them into a room, these poor people, and we'd pray over for hours, and we'd, I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. Somebody be saying that the whole time. I plead the blood, I plead the blood. I, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. I plead the blood. The, the pleading the blood isn't biblical. What are you pleading? What are you doing? What are you pleading the blood? What, what, are you, what are you doing when you're saying that? It's funny that I never thought about that when I was doing it. Well, what does it mean? What are we doing? Why do we overcome him with the power of the blood of the Lamb? Because my sins are forgiven by his blood. We're ransomed by his blood. How could Satan accuse me? How could Satan have any foothold in my life? He, he would because I've sinned, but now he doesn't because of the blood of Jesus. And by the word of our testimony, there's power in, in our testimony and that we don't love our lives even until death. Let me quickly go over these other two because I'm really late. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Now, we, this is the same passage. That say, this is the same book. 1 John is the same book that says, if you say you don't sin, you're a liar. So when it says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, it's not saying that we don't sin. In the context of the book, it's saying that we don't practice sin. As believers, we have a different practice. We practice righteousness. And we blow it and we need to get forgiveness. But we practice righteousness. Galatians says, of the lust of the flesh, all of these things, it says, and those who practice such things will not make it into the kingdom of God. Because as Christians, we no longer practice them. Doesn't mean that there isn't ever any maliciousness that happens in the life of a Christian. It means you don't practice it, okay? And so, and then it says, but he who is born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. The wicked one doesn't touch us. He can't touch us. God has put a hedge around us. We are protected from him. We, we, we are delivered from the lions and the roaring lion who's seeking who he may devour. Last one, 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Just a direct promise. God says, I'm faithful. The Lord is faithful. He will guard you from the evil one. That is such an awesome, tremendous passage. Such an easy one to memorize too. It's very short. All right, three things in closing. The battle is over the souls of men and women because we take the gospel with us wherever we go and we need to see people saved. Number two, the devil wants to make you ineffective in that battle. That's what his battle is over you. I think he could care less whether or not you end up going to heaven. But he doesn't want you taking anybody else with you. And so he's trying to make you ineffective. And he does a pretty good job in his battle. And um, number three, we've been guaranteed success. So he's fighting a losing battle as long as we do it. As long as we, are, we go about our work, as long as we do what we want to do, we're guaranteed success. So, so he'll lose for, for those of us who say, I'm in it. I'm in it to the very end because we're guaranteed to win. Stand with me, would you, and let's pray. Father, thank you so much as we consider what Daniel went through and um, that it kind of reflects our own life, that we have an enemy that's coming after us, that's scheming for us, that wants to devour us. And Lord, we pray that we would be involved in this battle, but properly, not full of these weird lies, but following what the truth is. And we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.